Mayor, it's seven o'clock. Uh, the uh, April 28th, 2015 regular meeting of the Newport Beach City Council will now reconvene. Uh, may we have the roll call, please? The record will reflect that Council Member Curry has an excused absence. Okay, uh, Mr. Harp, do we have a closed session report? Uh, thank you, Mayor Selich. There is no closed session report this evening. Okay, thank you. Uh, will you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilmember Duffield, followed by the invocation by Councilman Piotr. Please place your hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If you bow with me. Uh, I'm going to quote Ben Franklin here. He was in the middle of the Constitutional Convention. He said, I've lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall from the ground without his nose, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? God, we look to you and ask, for your, uh, ask humbly for your guidance and wisdom as we make decisions on behalf of the citizens tonight. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you. Okay, no uh, presentations uh, this evening. Uh, Madam Clerk? Notice to the public, the city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the city council. If the optional sign-in card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. The city council of Newport Beach welcomes and encourages community participation. Public comments are generally limited to three minutes per person to allow everyone to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. The City Council has a discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. As a courtesy, please turn cell phones off or set them in the silent mode. Now is the time for City Council announcements or matters which Council Members would like placed on a future agenda. Council Member Piotr. Council Member Petros. Uh, I have a couple of announcements, yes. Um, <coughs> Hogue Memorial Hospital Presbyterian is the largest employer in the city of Newport Beach. Uh, but recently they were uh, given another distinction. Becker Hospital Review is the, the trade journal that ranks uh, hospitals in America. And our own Hogue Hospital was uh, given the award of being one of the 100 great hospitals in America for this year. One of the 100 great in America, not in the state of California. In addition, Hogue achieved the magnet designation by the American Nurses Credentialing Center and health grades named Hogue Memorial among America's 50 best hospitals and awarded it the Distinguished Hospitals Award for Clinical Excellence in our backyard. So to Hogue Memorial Presbyterian, congratulations on that wonderful distinction and we are grateful that you are here in our community. And now the bad news. Uh, the, uh, the Orange County Sanitation District project along Coast Highway is ongoing. Uh, can we get uh, the sewer line construction on Coast Highway is almost done, dot, 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 for the summer. Uh, the Sand District project has been a real true test of patience for our community and its visitors. The district and its contractors understand that this project and the related delays have been a major inconvenience and they're determined to wrap up phase one of the project by late May. That's in four weeks. They have agreed to be done with this phase of the project. They've encountered some problems along the way. If you've been part of any of these hearings, you know that we have held them to task for that. So now, in order to make that late May deadline, the contractor will be working day and night for the duration of the project. 
We know this is also challenging, but please know that our goal is to get that highway fully operational in time for the influx of summer visitors and the related mm -hmm. traffic. Within the next few weeks, you'll start to see some areas where the open trenches are closed, the K rail removed, and the highway restored to near normal conditions. The toughest part for the remainder of this phase will be the extensive work that's underway near the Newport uh, Boulevard Bridge, which you saw the picture of. The original plan to tunnel under the bridge was recently abandoned when the drill rig was stopped in its tracks by an active gas line. Crews are now excavating the roadway to remove the drill head and install the remaining length of pipe through this area. Extra crews have been brought in to make the deadline and there will be times when this highway is down to one lane in each direction. For the most part, there will be two travel lanes open during peak periods eastbound in the morning and westbound lanes in the late afternoon and early evening. And hear me when I, when I bring this up. Please also keep our Mariner's Mile businesses in mind. They're open through this construction and they would desperately love to have you patronize them, restaurants, retail alike. They'd love to see your friendly faces. Pay them a visit if you're considering dining out or doing some shopping. We're, we've covered the parking meters, meters at the city parking lots at Tustin and Avon to provide free parking so that you'll go patronize them. So please make it a little bit easier on our businesses. If you have any questions or concerns, you see the uh, OC Sand District's uh, contact here. That number is 714-679-2088. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the long wind. Okay, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Dixon. Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A uh, couple of community announcements. A uh, couple weeks ago, you heard me promote the Taste of Balboa at Balboa Village. That was the kickoff to the <coughs> Newport to Ensenada race. I'm happy to report that over 2,000 people enjoyed the fun food and chalk art and just a great uh, time to be had by all in the community. So it was really a terrific day, a beautiful day, and a great kickoff. A uh, couple of community events I just thoroughly enjoyed attending on Arbor Day. I represented the mayor at Anderson Elementary School. The third grade class uh, had learned all about the importance of trees in our environment and sustainability and trees in our lives. And uh, we were there to give them, I was there representing the mayor to present a proclamation to the third grade class. And the principal of Anderson Elementary, Dr. Shannon Bray, uh, really has an outstanding group of students. I was very proud of that. Then last Friday, this is kind of school week, I guess, um, I had the pleasure to be on hand at Harborview Elementary with uh, school board member Karen Yelsey uh, to receive a check for $2,800 raised by the students, their student council, on behalf of the Special Olympics. The, Har the Harbor View Student Council organized the fundraising as part of the team's ki Team Kids program. The funds will go to support the Newport Beach host town sponsorship of the Special Olympic team members who will be staying in Newport Beach for the Special Olympics to be held in Los Angeles July 25th through August 2nd. So thanks also to Dr. Todd Schmidt, the principal of Harborview. It was a really a fun, fun morning. Uh, last Saturday, many of you throughout the community were aware that our CERT volunteers set up command posts and responded to simulated disaster incidents in 13 neighborhoods. The drills tested radio communications within each neighborhood and at the Emergency Operations Center at City Hall. So it was really good to know that our CERT teams are working hard to make sure we all stay safe. A couple of announcements for our wonderful library. The fen Friends of, libra of the Library will be having their once a year book sale, two bucks a bag, Saturday, May 2nd, this Saturday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. So they urge everyone's attendance. And then the second annual Bunnies and Books for Kids Festival. I guess that's for you, Scott, too. <laughs> Sponsored by the uh, Library Foundation and Friends of Library. And this will be calling all kids who love bunnies and books. Uh, and do I don't Oh, Saturday, May 9th, 10.30 to 1 p.m., Central Library. And then finally, one other item on a business note. Uh, we've probably all been reading in the papers recently about the community impacts of online short-term, uh, I guess it's short-term rentals. And I'd like to uh, bring this up just from a standpoint of 
Oh, let me get my notes in front of me. That the, from a revenue standpoint, most importantly, the city is losing a significant amount of transient occupancy tax revenue due to noncompliance of the city's short-term rental ordinances. I recommend that we investigate the causes of noncompliance, the factors that encourage or enable it, and what changes, if any, need to be made to capture lost revenue. So, uh, Dave, I'll just turn this over to you, best how we would proceed to look more. I think we need to look into this and understand it and its impact on, on our community and the tourist revenues that we hold dear. So, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Muldoon. Yes, last time I brought this up, uh, it wasn't discussed. We were busy with other things. The uh, mooring issue went, went to the uh, Harbor Commission and the uh, dock tax issue, which we discussed. But I'd like to re-agendize a study session, this time focusing on commercial docks, ensuring that they're paying a fair market value. Okay, uh, Council Member uh, Duffield. I have none. <clears throat> I just have a couple uh, here. Um, on the uh, 22nd, I attended the fire department promotional ceremony. We had, I think it was six um, firefighters and paramedics uh, get uh, promoted. Um, and then on the 23rd, we had the uh, opening night of the film festival, which is still going on. So I would encourage uh, anyone that has an interest in film to check out the offerings for that. That continues through uh, most of the remainder of this week. And then on the 24th, we had the start of the Ensenada race. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is there was no wind, and it was a very slow start. <clears throat> um, and then um, on May the 13th, Speak Up Newport is going to uh, have their monthly program on the fire rings. It's one month before um, it, this issue goes to the Coastal Commission. It'll be in the community room across the foyer here. Um, the uh, reception starts at 5.30, and the program itself starts at 6 o'clock. And then lastly, on Saturday, May the 2nd, we're going to have a free document shredding. Uh, CRNR, our um, um, refuse disposal contractor in the city, will host a free um, event for shredding documents. It's going to be in the Oasis Senior Center's auxiliary parking lot. That's at the northwest corner of Marguerite and Fifth Avenue in Corona Del Mar. Um, Newport Reach Beach residents that receive trash and recycling service from CRNR are welcome to bring all their documents for shredding. And if you have any further questions on it, you can call CRNR at their customer service number, which is 949-625-6735. Mr. Mayor, before you leave that, uh, Ms. Dixon, do you want to talk about your town hall? Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dave. Yes, uh, please, uh, one and all, come. Uh, my District 1 town hall, but it is open to all residents. Uh, Monday, May 4th, at the Old City Council Council Chambers at 6.30 p.m. Well, uh, the primary topic is boardwalk safety, and Chief Jay Johnson and his staff will be there. Also, Public Works will be talking about some much-needed improvements to McFadden Square and any other questions that residents may have. So please uh, join us on Monday. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay, thank you. Okay, Madam Clerk. This is the time in which council members may pull items for consent calendar um, discussions, items one through 11. Public comments are now invited on consent calendar. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. If any item is removed from the consent calendar by a council member, members of the public are invited to speak on each item for up to three minutes per item. All matters listed under consent calendar are considered to be routine and will all be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. Council members have received detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending an action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the City Council votes on the motion unless members of the City Council request specific items to be discussed and are removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Okay, thank you. Uh, does any member of the public uh, wish to comment on any item on the consent calendar, items 1 through 11? Mayor Selich and members of the Council, my name is Jim Mosher, and I would like to underscore my written comments on two of the items. The first of those is item four, which is the second reading of two ordinances having to do with appeals. One changes four sections of the zoning code. The other inserts a new call for review procedure into 44 other sections of the Newport Beach Municipal Code. 
I think it is very unlikely that anyone on the council or on a commission is going to call up a matter for review unless they're either doing it as a political or financial favor for a friend or think there is something wrong with the previous outcome. Both of those reasons create a clear presumption of bias, and I would have hoped you would have heeded the appeals court warning to not let the person who initiates an appeal set in judgment on it. It would have been very easy to incorporate into these ordinances a requirement for recusal. I would also have hoped that there would have been a better explanation of why at one time we thought we needed to hire independent hearing officers to render decisions insulated from local influences, and now for some unexplained reason, we seem to think that their decisions can be ignored and overridden. The other item I want to comment on is number 11, which is one of two items on tonight's agenda where outside parties signed what the public thought was a binding agreement with the city, and now they want to change the deal they made. Item 11 earmarks $30,000 of tax dollars to support the Balboa Angling Club. The problem with this is that for 68 years, the city has given the club free use of a prime piece of city-owned waterfront real estate near the Balboa Pavilion with the clear and unambiguous understanding that the club would be totally responsible for all the costs of the construction, repair, and maintenance of the structures on that property. Now they want the city taxpayers to pay half the costs of the repairs. I would suggest that the club, knowing for 68 years its obligations, should have been prudent enough to set aside the money it needed. I would also like to suggest that the city has, in effect, been making a very substantial financial contribution to the operation of this club for those many years. I don't know precisely how substantial because the way we assess the value of Tidelands property places very little at 50 cents per square foot annual rent on that, but I believe that if they were to try to rent an equivalent property from a private party, it would be a very large expense on their part. So taxpayers have been subsidizing them for many years, and I don't see why we should further subsidize them for a lack of prudent financial planning. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, public comments on the consent calendar? Okay, seeing none, we'll close that. Uh, staff, do you have any items to pull or comment on? On that same item that Mr. Mosier is commenting on, our recommendation is that the amount be not to exceed 40,000, not 30,000. <clears> we have an estimate in from the, about the amount of work that'll be done, it's about 80. And if this is a 50-50 match, we would offer 40, up to 40. Okay, so uh, when we vote on the consent calendar, it'll be for 40,000 and not 30,000. Up to, excuse me, correct, up to. Okay, um, any m member of the council want to pull anything? Councilmember Muldoon? Yes. Councilmember Duffy? Yes. Councilmember Piotr? Uh, I wouldn't mind hearing the public benefit of item number 11, if you or someone else would be prepared to do that. Okay, you want me to do it now? Uh, or rather than pull, pull it, uh, that's fine, you explain now, thanks. Okay. Well, I think that the, uh, the Angling Club provides a lot of benefit. It's an 82-year-old um, organization in the city. It, um, it operates the White Sea Bass Pen in the harbor, which has been primarily responsible for the comeback in the White Sea Bass population. It uh, operates and promotes um, uh, youth uh, programs for fishing for uh, youth in, uh, in Orange County. And uh, another benefit that it provides is that it has a... Um, a public weighing scale that any member of the public uh, that it's uh, fishing is free to use to uh, weigh their fish, which is important if you're looking to uh, get a fish entered into the record books because it's an official weighing station. So it does provide a lot of benefit to the harbor and it's part of the, uh, you know, the culture and uh, ambiance of our harbor, if you will. So I certainly think it's a worthwhile item to support. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Council Member Petros. I have none. Councilmember uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon. I have none. Okay, and I have none. So I'll entertain a motion on the consent calendar. Um, Mr. Mayor, I move the consent calendar items one through eleven. Second. Okay. Please vote when the screen comes up. 
Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance titles for items three and four. For item three, ordinance number 2015-10, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach amending Newport Beach Municipal Code subsection 12.44.020F to add the northerly side of West Balboa Boulevard to on-street parking meter zone six. Ordinance number 2015-8, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach amending Title 20 of the Newport Beach Municipal Code related to Planning Commission and City Council appeals and calls for review. And ordinance number 2015-9, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach amending various sections of the Newport Beach Municipal Code related to appeals and calls for review. The motion carries unanimously, 6-0. Okay, thank you. Uh, public comments on non-agenda items, Madam Clerk? Public comments are invited on non-agenda items generally considered to be within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. Any comments uh, on non-agenda items, please come forward. Your item's not on the agenda. Good evening, Council members and staff. My name is Phil Milner. I've lived in 901 Almond Place in East Bluff Homes since 1986. I'm a past president of East Bluff Homeowners Association, currently co-chair of our ad hoc stadium committee, and I'm a founding member of Newport Citizens for Responsible Growth. The latter group encompasses seven of eight homeowners associations with nearly 2,000 homes around the Corona Del Mar High School area. I'm also a parent of a son and daughter who both graduated from Corona Del Mar High School. Tonight, I wanna to introduce our organization, Newport Citizens for Responsible Growth, and mention some of our goals. NCRG desires the opportunity to educate the school board and also the city council on the negative consequences to our neighborhood of the expanded athletic complex at CDM High School proposed by the Newport Mesa Unified School District and CDM Foundation. We believe field and track improvements are needed. We fully support these improvements. However, we also desire the opportunity to work with school district staff and school board to develop a mitigated project scope we have many ideas that we believe can help mitigate the project's harmful side effects while allowing CDM to meet its needs. Several school board members have been working with our group since December of last year. Deputy Superintendent Paul Reed and Superintendent Fred Navarro have also been working with our group. We have been assured that the project, once defined, will instruct the architect to include various mitigations for light trespass and noise. Considering our conflicting agendas, we have a very good working relationship with both the school board and the staff. We're also concerned about traffic congestion, safety, parking, trash, and other uncomfortable consequences this facility might bring to us. The city recently approved our Aurelia Street permit parking requirements, and now we are faced with a potentially bigger parking problem coming onto our streets. Our East Bluff Homeowners Association board is going so far as to reconsider gating to secure our streets from the overflow congestion the new facility might bring. Several high schools in California have developed what Leland High School in San Jose calls a contract with the community with legally binding use agreements to their lighted fields. These contracts and use agreements restrict the number of games and practices as well as times that the lights may be used. Our group is offering to be the community representative to work with the school district to codify the pro proposed use agreements as the project is further defined. Other members of Newport Citizens for Responsible Growth and I expect to be back to report on our efforts to the City Council. We are aware that the project is out of your hands at this time. We want you to be aware of the problems of our neighborhood will face and the potential mitigations that we have and will continue to propose to the school district. I will make myself available to council members and staff if anyone has questions for me or our organization. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Thank you. Mayor Selich? Yes, Councilmember Pestros. Uh, Mr. Milner, thank you for coming, and, and uh, your, your timing is perfect. Uh, please know that, as, as you might remember, I, I <coughs> gave of remember. my own time to uh, yeah, we really visit appreciate with the it. Bluffs, and uh, will continue to avail myself to the group uh, with my professional expertise, if that's something that might seem helpful. You'll, you'll find his calling. Um, I, I, I appreciate your acknowledgement that this is not our issue. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, but but I know that uh, Council Member Muldoon uh, will be taking an active role in this, but in as much as we can help educate the, the public to make do. good decisions, I think right. that that would be in all our interests. Well, we, we trying to get in the middle between the people that are uh, semi-urban terrorists out there versus the uh, people who want to build anything they can because it's a sovereign nation on the school district property. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, any other public comments? Please come forward. Good evening. My name is Paul Doremus. I'm a 40-year resident and homeowner of Newport Beach. I am currently the Executive Vice President of the Villa Granada Homeowners Association, which is located in the Bluffs. And along with Phil, I'm a founding member of the group that we've been talking about with regards to the uh, preservation of our neighborhood. Um, since buying my home years ago, I have watched with sadness and astonishment the unparalleled expansion of Corona Del Mar High School. I went to Corona Del Mar High School and I know that it is a very limited campus and the school board has continued to compare it with the other four, treating it as one of the same. It's not, it's smaller and the density most importantly is astonishingly different. We have two lane streets on the east, north and south portion of the school and a very limited East Bluff Drive. This is an infrastructure that cannot be improved. There are currently 2,500 students with thousands of cars going back and forth every day. To this point, we are all ardent supporters of everything educational. But you cannot square a circle in a situation like this and put a stadium or sports complex, as it's now called, the size of which that they're proposing. They're really accountable, the school board is accountable to no one, unfortunately, but we've stepped up and we've gotten great respect from them. And with Phil's assistance and guidance, we've made great strides because we want to be civilized and patient and, and considered. Again, we know that there are improvements that are direly needed over there, but 1,500, 2,000 stadium seat is not one of them. Our home values have gone down almost 10%. We're in most cases having an excellent school if Corona Del Mar's re reputation would be fortunate. But unfortunately, our day-to-day -day quality of life from parking to ingress and egress has been nearly strangled. I happen to have property behind the church. And literally, there are six times during the day that I have to stop and think as if I were living on Balboa Island with a small little, little bridge, if I can go out and sit in my car for 20 minutes to get around a corner or just stay home and use that time and then go out. So we're hoping to keep you apprised of it. We realize that you're only involved to the city, to the, to the street and the ingress and the egress of the, uh, of the driveways, but we're hoping that you will help us and understand our concerns with regards to this extraordinary expansion, which is been not good for an awful lot of our quality of lives. So thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable Mayor, distinguished council, lady and gentlemen, I come and stand before you tonight with a positive proposal and plan for a natural, low maintenance, open space park in Newport Beach. I'd like to do two things, three things actually. I'm gonna give you a brief background. Could you give us your name please? Oh, I'm sorry. John Sturgis, I've been a 30 year resident of Cliff Haven community. I'd like to do two things, three things. One, give you a brief background and then I'd like to propose the uh, plan, which is a concept plan and then a proposal to the city. By way of background, Cliff Haven is one of the oldest developed neighborhoods in Newport Beach and it's comprised of 300, over 360 homes, family homes. It's located above the cliff of Nabal Bay Club and the Pacific Coast Highway. It's a quiet, family-oriented community. No sidewalks, no street lights. The people living in Cliff Haven are friendly, they know their neighbors, and they take very kind and high pride for their community. This proposal tonight is to develop a natural open <coughs> space park in Cliff Haven. And the objective is to create a low profile, low maintenance natural open space park. And the goal is to create an environmentally safe place for people to walk, sit and enjoy nature. Before I get into the proposal and the plan, I'd like to thank uh, Mayor Selich and Councilman Dixon and Councilman Duffield for the positive response that they've given me as well as the verbal okay from the Parks and Rec to pursue this plan. I'd like to now, if I may, present this. And I'd like to start with a concept plan. If you could turn to page two, is an aerial view of the parcel. Yeah, you it's got located... about a minute left here. Oh, sorry. Duffy, you know where it is. <laughs> it's 
It's on the immediate corner of Cliff Drive and King's Place. The lot is a, a, a parcel or a lot and a half. The property has been owned by a gentleman in our neighborhood for 10 years. It's been on the market now with a green fence around it for over five years. If you turn to the next page, this is a concept plot plan for the open space park. Similar, very similar to the castaways. There would be pathways, benches, drought resistant trees and plants, sycamore trees, pepper trees, oak trees, and everything would be low maintenance and drought resistant. That's a concept plan. The proposal, as I mentioned, is a natural open space. The triangular shaped park would be a challenge to uniformly build a home, and the owner is interested, as I mentioned, in selling the land. The Newport Beach Parks and Recreation has given the in, uh, undivided approval to create an outdoor open space, low maintenance park like the Castaways. My proposal to the council tonight is on behalf of the city, Cliffhaven community would like to propose that the city buy the land and the community will, will unite together to create and build the park. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Before I go, I would like to know the, the next step in this, if there's a, a work session or, or a plan, a meeting to develop it in more detail. Um, I don't see any contact information on here. If you can give uh, Mr. Kiff your contact information, he'll be in touch with you. Okay, great. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other public comments, please come forward. Hello, City Council. My name is Michael Carrillo. I um, acquired a parking ticket in your city uh, in a parking lot that I've never parked in before. It's, it's down across uh, Balboa uh, at Palm near the Harborside restaurant. We were patronizing, as you suggested we should, uh, whale watching that day and it was my wife and her friend's birthday. So I dropped them off in front of the harbor side, paid for parking right at the curb there and realized it was only two hour parking. And our cruise was gonna be two and a half hours. So I moved the car to the inner parking lot where someone said, you, you can park in there, I think you can park longer. Well, I got in line there and someone said, that's only two hour parking too. So I then moved the car where someone said you could go across Balboa there, you go up Palm and there, I, you all probably familiar with that parking lot over there, and there are probably a hundred signs in there that say, you know, various things from no parking to no backing in. And I, I, it's the first time I've ever really seen a parking lot where you can't back in. I lived in Huntington Beach for 12 years, Westminster for another eight and 11, 11 years, and uh, you can back into all the beach parking there. So I really wasn't, cons really didn't think that I couldn't back in. So anyway, the way I approached that parking lot was up Palm, or down Palm, across Balboa, curved around where all the buses park, lots of signs, curved around and was like almost exiting that parking lot. You can kind of turn and come out of that parking lot. And there's a little lot to the right, and I believe that there's a condo or something there, and they kind of use that for overflow parking from what I got from the parking citation guys. Anyway, when you, when you bake that, turn there and you're gonna make a right right into that parking lot, you cannot see any signs that say don't back in. There's not one sign that you can see there. I suggest the sign that's at the entrance of that little parking lot be moved to the back of that little parking lot to where everyone that enters that can see the no backing in sign and not only the people that enter head on. So if I had come straight into the parking lot, I would have seen the signs, they face you, they're right in front of you. The way I came around and made a right, you make a right right around the sign. You don't see the sign. It's right, it, you see the pole. You, you, all you see is the edge of a sign. So anyway, I utilized the, uh, I utilized the, uh, the legal you know, uh, appeal online. I got denied. Then I utilized your mediator who sits with you and swears you in and you explained to her, I thought she understood. I explained, I brought pictures, I surrendered all the pictures to her and the got diagrams. 30 seconds left. Anyway, I'm not here to get my money back. What I'm here is to have the sign possibly move to the back of that lot, not even adding a sign, no more cost, just move it to the back to where other people don't get that $42 ticket. Because you can't see it. If you enter from the way I did, you cannot see that sign. And I thought I explained it to her, but I got denied again, so. 
Uh, that's, that's all I want to say. I thought perhaps you guys could have the sign moved. And I think maybe that lot is not a city lot any longer. I think it's an outsourced lot. But, uh, you know, it's a lot of revenue. Thank you. Um, I'm Just, sure that our staff is taking note of, uh, of your situation there. They are taking notes. We'll take a look at that. We can always improve our signage. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other public comments on non-agenda items? Okay. Uh, or reports from City Council on committee activities. Uh, Council Member Piotr, any reports on committee activities? Council Member Petros? I have none. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon? No, I have none. Councilmember Muldoon? None. Councilmember Duffy? None. I just have uh, two quick ones. One is the Tidelands Management Committee met last week and uh, reviewed the, um, the Tidelands Capital Plan and um, deferred any discussions on the Balboa Island seawalls till after the Council has its study session on that. And then one thing I, I should have announced under Council announcements is that we do have openings on our boards and commissions, and I would encourage anyone that's interested to uh, fill out an application. And what is the deadline again, Leilani, for that? May 13th at 4 o'clock. May 13th at 4 o'clock. So if you're interested in planning commission, parks commission, library board, um, arts commission, civil service board, um, you can go online or go to the city clerk's office and get an app application. We're always looking for uh, good candidates for these important uh, city board and commission positions so um, if you have an interest in it uh, uh, grab an application and get it submitted okay so we'll move on to public hearings our first public hearing is item number 12 it's the uptown newport development agreement amendment located at 4311 through 4321 jamboree road staff good evening mayor Selage, members of the council i'm kim brant your community development director and this public hearing is to address a proposed amendment to the Uptown um, Newport Projects Development Agreement. And the Newport, um, excuse me, the Uptown Newport Project was approved originally by the City Council back in 2013. It included entitlements that allowed the construction or the eventual construction of uh, 1,244 dwelling units on 25 acres with some ancillary retail uses. Uh, as part of that entitlement process, the city entered into, with the applicant, a development agreement. And a development agreement is a contract or agreement between the city and the applicant that conveys a vested right to develop the, uh, the property under the, uh, pursuant to the entitlements for a prescribed period of time in exchange for public benefits that are given to the city that the city is not normally entitled to request as part of the zoning approval process. So the amendment that's before you this evening is the first proposed amendment to the development agreement, and the applicant is requesting a, an amendment or a change to the payment schedule in the development agreement as it relates to the payment of public benefit fees and the payment of the parkland in lieu of dedication fee, which we call simply park fees. So just for your um, um, background, the project is located up in the airport business area off of Jamboree Road. This is the Bristol's, uh, Bristol Street 73 coming through here, and this is Campus Drive over to the, to the west. And the project site is located off of Jamboree. This is a, a very conceptual plan of the overall site development. It's going to be constructed in two phases. The red lines denote the distinction between phase one and phase two. And phase one is already in the works, so to speak, um, and we have demolition activities occurring. And we're expecting um, approximately 680 units to be developed in phase one as well as 11,500 square feet of retail. And the balance, of which will occur in phase two, will occur anywhere from five to seven to 10 years out. Here's some conceptual renderings of the phase one development. This is the project entry off of Jamboree at Fairchild. This is a little further north on Jamboree. Again, this is um, multi-storied uh, multi residential. 
Here are some internal uh, corridor views. And this is a view of both a residential product adjacent to the proposed park. So the uh, development agreement um, has two different types of fees uh, to be paid in, as part of the development agreement. And the first fee is a public benefit fee. And the public benefit fee is only a fee that we apply um, in conjunction with development agreements. The proposed fee that was, or the uh, adopted fee that was negotiated as part of this development agreement was $32,500 per residential unit. If the entire project is built at its maximum capacity of 1,244 units, that equals $40,000 and 430,000, I mean, 40000000 <laughs> I'm sorry, $40,430,000. Maybe we can change that. <laughs> and the payment schedule is that the fee is due at the, t at the time of the issuance of building permits on a per unit basis. And another component of the, of the development agreement is that a consumer price index escalator is built into the development agreement that began on January 1st of this year. The applicant is requesting a change in the timing of the payment of that public benefit fee. So as I said, currently the, the development agreement requires the fee to be paid at the time of permit issuance. And the request is to have that fee paid at the time of certificate of occupancy, again, on a per unit basis. So the practical um, implication of that fee deferral is about an 18 month to 24 month time frame in terms of the difference in when the city would, uh, would uh, uh, obtain that fee. So um, as I indicated before, there is an escalator that's um, included as part of the development agreement, which is adjusted on an annual basis. So in, in reality, with each um, year that the fee is deferred, the city will be um, collecting a higher <coughs> per unit cost or per, per unit fee. So that fee that initially started out as 32,000, $500 per unit as at the time the development uh, agreement was adopted will increase to approximately $33,849 by January 1st of 2017 based on our estimates. So staff believes that the fee deferral will be offset by the escalator that's already contained within the development agreement. So the park fee is, a, is another um, benefit that's included within the development agreement. The city does require that in conjunction with new residential subdivisions that parkland be um, provided at a, a set rate that's established in our municipal code. As part of the development agreement, it was negotiated that that park fee would be pay, uh, paid at the time a final map is uh, recorded and the first building permit is issued for a phase of development. And um, uh, based on the number of units that we anticipate to be constructed in the process, we expect we would have ex um, expected 13.62 acres of parkland to be dedicated. Well, the site is only 25 acres in, in size, so it's not practically possible to con construct or build 13.26 acres of parkland on the uh, development site. So. There's an in-lieu fee that is charged uh, for the, the balance of the parkland that's not provided on the property. And if, if no parks were provided on the site, the, the fee value would be $34 million and, and 50000 added on at the end, which um, is approximately $2.5 million uh, per acre value. So that is before any credits. And that... $34 million is reduced through parkland dedication and improvements, private recreational facilities, and private rec recreational facilities that are open to the public. And so that will all be calculated as each subdivision map comes in. So the applicant is requesting that, um, that the payment be due at issuance of building permits on a per unit basis as opposed to all of the uh, fees being collected at the time of the first building permit is issued um, for a particular phase of development. And uh, the 
current development agreement does not include any type of escalator on the parkland fee as it did for the public benefit fee. So staff is uh, proposing that an offset be included in the development agreement amendment that would apply an annual interest rate that would, apl um, that would be applicable to any deferred payments for the parkland fee. So staff is recommending a 4% um, interest rate for phase one and a 5% interest rate for phase two. And uh, staff believes that that would be our cost of borrowing should we have to go out and borrow for that um, deferred, uh, deferred payment value while we're waiting for those units to be uh, permitted. So in summary, the Planning Commission does recommend approval of the proposed changes to to the development agreement and they had recommended that additional public benefits be included in the development agreement and that is why staff is recommending that an annual fee or an annual interest rate be applied to the parkland fee um, deferral and we do believe that the proposed changes will not significantly affect the development agreement's overall terms and that the city will be appropriately compensated for the proposed change in the payment schedule. I would be happy to answer any questions. Hey, Council Member Petros. Uh, two real quick questions. Kim, the um, couple of the, the variables here include the fact of they're tied to final maps. Do we know how many maps have been or will be recorded with phase one, for example? Are they just, is it just each individual building will, will create a map? Thank you. I had to confer with the applicant. Um, Mr. John Santry is here representing um, the shop off group, but we are anticipating that there will be one final map with each phase. Okay. Can you go back to the to the site plan that you had? I can't see it. <laughs> Scroll. Oh, just peek. Yeah, there, Thank there you. we go. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> so there, there's conceivably four buildings within phase one then, or four buildings within the, the map over phase one. Correct. Okay. The, the notion of this being on a per unit basis, if this is vertical residential, are we really, do we really mean per, per building? Well, right. So... If You're you not going to go phase floor by floor and, and say that floor gets its occupancy, the next one does. It's, it's for the whole building. That is correct. So if you look, correct, that, it, that would be correct. The, the, the certificate of occupancy would be for an entire building. It would not be occur on a unit by unit basis. So it would take into account all the units within any particular building. With this concept plan, we're looking at four different buildings. I think building one and building two, we are confident that those are gonna be two separate buildings. I don't think we have that same level of confidence for building three and building four. So in practicality, for the building one and building two, there's going to be uh, 460 units. And so we would be collecting those fees for the park fee at the time of building permit issuance. So we'll get all the fees for 460 units at one time. And then when they are finaled, the park fee is, is with the payment of, excuse me, with the pulling of the building permit. So initially the development agreement said that when the first building permit was being issued for an entire phase or an entire final map, all of the fee would be develop, uh, required at that time. So at this point, that's, we anticipate that only 460 units will be pulled at one time and the balance of, to get to 680 would occur at a later date. And you look, I'm, I'm sorry I'm, if I'm, I'm confusing confused. you I, even I, more. I think what I'm getting hung up on, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, th this notion of deferred units in, in, the, in the text, is it conceivable that because this is all one map that all the park fees could be deferred until the last building comes online. No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other council questions? Okay. Seeing none, I'll invite the applicant to come forward. Good morning. 
Good evening, Mayor Selich and council members. My name is John Santry. I'm with Shop Off Realty Investments, and we're the applicant to uh, to change this development agreement. Really, the uh, the impetus for the change or the ask for the change is to add flexibility where where we would like it. Um, currently, we have two developers in phase one, and there may be multiple developers in phase two. Unknown, obviously, that is a, a later development tied to the uh, the exit of Tower Jazz and uh, the expiration of their lease. Um, but right now what we're seeing is just trying to create flexibility, um, especially in the payment of the park fee, which as, as, uh, as staff has pointed out, was originally tied to the first permit. So right now in our, in our phase one, we have two buildings that are apartments gonna be built by the Pacern Group, and we have what we call lot one in the final map, which is shown as building, the pad for building four and building three. Um, if perchance that buyer of lot one is a townhome builder, potentially could pull a permit in the next six months where the permit for, for Pacern is maybe four, five, six months after that, brings into an, an issue with financing um, because most of this would be financed through a construction loan. You're asking a developer to fund in advance park fees <laughs> based on a building permit pulled by another builder developer. So we, we just giving that flexibility and the time that, that once their financing is in place and they're ready to pull building permits, then, then they would pay their fees. And they, we understand that the escalator, the 4% for phase one, um, you know, is is applicable. We're we're fine with that, um, and we think that having additional flexibility makes it a better project and makes it you know more viable for those individual developers. I can answer any questions if you have them. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other speakers uh, on this item? Please come forward. <clears throat> Mayor Selich and members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. Uh, referring back to my earlier comment, this is the second of the two items on your agenda tonight where the signer of what the public thought was a binding agreement is now wanting to change that agreement. Uh, first thing I wanted to call you to your attention is from the staff report, it tells you that this came to you from the Planning Commission with a 3-2 recommendation in favor of the proposal that you see or something similar to that. I wanted to point out to you, if you look at the Planning Commission minutes on page 1224 of your packet, at the end of the page it appears that the motion to recommend it to you failed. It says that there were two ayes and three noes. I don't know if you've read the packet carefully enough to notice that or were confused by that. I would like to point out that there's a missing page in the minutes, there is a page beyond this. There was further discussion at the Planning Commission and eventually it did wind up in a 3-2 vote in favor of the recommendation. I think it's fair to say that all of the Planning Commissioners were a little bit uncomfortable being asked to make a financial recommendation to you when that is not their area of expertise. And the two dissenters felt that a deal is normally a deal and they didn't think anything unpredictable had changed in this project that would justify changing the deal that the city formerly had. So I think that accurately summarizes what is on the missing page of the minutes. I myself would like to point out, which they did not anticipate, that there's a companion item on tonight's agenda, the very next item after this one, in which the city is being asked to enter into a rather, to the public, complex looking financial arrangement to allow these investors who the Planning Commission were thought were sophisticated investors who knew what they were getting into will allow them to take advantage of publicly issued bonds and will be the beneficiaries of those. And as I gather from the staff report for that coming item, the purpose of those bonds is to encourage and make possible for them. This is on, on the development agreement, not the next I'm item. just trying to tie the two together. The purpose of the bonds in the next item, and I think you need to consider the two items together, is to allow the developer to provide the fees to the city in a timely fashion, faster rather than slower, and it seems contradictory to me that here they're asking to make the payment slower. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments on this item? 
Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to council for uh, motion. Mayor Selich? Yes. Um, I, originally, because I'm not a finance guy, I, I, one, I couldn't understand it, so I needed to do a little extra homework, and I think that by doing so, I, I got a level of comfort with myself. And also examples that you laid out to me with uh, some of our other more successful developments uh, indicated that uh, allowing that flexibility actually does mature a much better project and better assets for the community and a better outcome for the city. Uh, so with that new understanding and a review again of the terms of that uh, agreement, I would move the, uh, the action to uh, one, find that all the significant uh, environmental concerns have been addressed in the previous uh, EIR and introduce ordinance 2015-11 uh, for uh, the amendment to the development agreement for Uptown Newport. A second. Okay, any further comments? Okay, seeing none, please vote. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for ordinance number 2015-11, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach, approving First Amendment to Development Agreement number DA 2012-003 for the 25.05-acre planned community known as Uptown Newport, located at 4311 to 4321 Jamboree Road. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, thank you. Okay, next uh, hearing is item number 13. This is the participation in the statewide community infrastructure program. Staff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of city council. Uh, this public hearing uh, proposes the city join the statewide community infrastructure program known as SKIP. Uh, this program makes tax exempt financing um, available to developers who want to finance their public uh, infrastructure obligation or uh, the related developer fees. Uh, the debt is secured by the land with no further commitment by the city. Uh, the city is indemnified by the developer. And uh, further, the city is not obligated to, to approve all developer applications for this type of financing. Um, but in short, that, that really concludes my remarks, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, do we have any questions of staff on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll open it up for public comment. Any member of the public wish to comment? Okay, seeing none, I'll close it, bring it back for motion. Is there a motion on this item? Sure, I'll move approval okay, for staff recommendation. Second. I second. <laughs> Don't do it all at once. <laughs> okay, and there'll be no further discussion. Please vote. The motion carries unanimously, 6-0. Okay, next uh, public hearing is item number 14. This is the award of the non-exclusive solid waste collection franchise to Skyline Construction Services Incorporated, DBA, uh, SCOR Industries, a California corporation. Staff? Mayor, members of the council, Mike Bazzani, acting co-director for municipal operations. On April 14th, you adopted a resolution of intention to consider the award of a non-exclusive trash solid waste franchise to Skyline Industries. Um, they're a demolition contractor that also operates a small, a medium volume construction and demo um, processing facility in Rialto. Their application um, met all the requirements of section 12.63 of the municipal code. Uh, if approved tonight, they're Franchise will expire on March 1st of 2017, along with all the other um, 32 solid waste franchises. That concludes my report. Okay, any questions of staff? Seeing none, I'll open it for public comment. Any member of the public wish to comment? Please come forward. Uh, Mayor Selich and members of the council, my name is Jim Mosher. I would, I would just like to comment on the environmental review or analysis that is in the staff report. For the benefit of the new council members, remind them that one of the former council members was repeatedly reminding us that the, although the analysis says that there's no potential for a significant effect on the environment, the practice in Newport Beach of having a great proliferation of individual 
trash hauling contracts, we just heard that there's 32 of these franchises operating in Newport Beach, can cumulatively have the effect that we have more vehicle miles driven than we might have if we had a more coordinated system with a fewer number of haulers involved. This particular one is not clear from the staff report. I think we heard it's just connected with construction demolition, but there's other ones like for picking up trash on alleys and so forth. And it would probably be beneficial and environmentally wise to have a smaller number rather than repeat trips through the city. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on this item? Okay, bring it back to council for motion in the second. Why don't everyone jump at once? <laughs> Move staff recommendation to approve the franchise agreement. I s okay. Okay, um, no further discussion. Please vote. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for ordinance number 2015-7, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach granting a non-exclusive solid waste franchise to Skyline Construction Services, Inc., doing business as Gore Industries, a California corporation, to provide solid waste collection services upon the city streets and within the City of Newport Beach. The motion carries unanimously 6-0. Okay, our next public hearing is item number 15, the electric vehicle charging stations fee. Staff report on this one. We're moving faster than the staff can rotate amongst the now chairs. we speed up the staff here. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. I am Evelyn Zinn, your revenue manager. Um, the city has three electric vehicle charging stations located right here at the Civic Center garage. We looked at um, what other cities were doing with their feed structure and determined that a per kilowatt hour fee seem to be the fairest. And that works out, it would help us recover our costs and at the same time encourage alternative energy use. Um, and that worked out to be about 20 cents per kilowatt hour or roughly $7 to charge up your average car. And that's the end of my report, if there are any questions. Okay, any questions of staff? Okay, seeing none, I'll open it up for any public comment. Please come forward. Uh, Mayor Selich, members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. It was uh, nearly two years ago, July 2013, that former Planning Commissioner Hawkins brought to the council's attention at that time the fact that you could charge up your car for free in the city parking lot, which is odd because he, he was a beneficiary of that, as he said he had a plug-in electric car. Uh, and the concern he raised was, was the city making a gift of public funds. Um, that that is an issue that I am often concerned about. Uh, there was at one, there was, and actually still is in the California Constitution, a very clear prohibition against cities or any part of the California government giving away public funds, but that, that has become muddied over the years with the idea that a gift can be justified if there is a public benefit from that. And I suppose in this case you could say, as Ms. Sang said, that there perhaps is some environmental benefit in promoting electric use, but I would not offer that as a justification here. Main question I would have is what happened to the city's own electric fleet. Uh, back in 2013, we were promoting the use of electric cars for our city employees, inspectors, and so forth, and many of us seem to think those cars have kind of disappeared. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back for a motion. Mayor Selich, yeah, uh, just an observation. I uh, I was wondering, uh, Mr. Moser, why you don't sit closer to the mic? It would might be better for us all if you did. Um, Mayor Selich, I will move the uh, uh, adopting resolution 2015-27, uh, charging the fee as proposed by the city, uh, which is a cost recovery but does not include uh, other additional charges such as staff time or anything else. This is clearly to recover our costs. Okay, thank you. Okay, second on that one. Okay, please vote. Oops, I see someone wants Councilmember Piotr. Yeah, just quick question for staff. We've got three stations. Are they occupied all the time? And are, is there changeover as far as when a car is charged, they pull away and a new car pulls up?
That's a great question. Um, my understanding is on most weekdays, it gets crowded in the morning and then it frees up in the afternoon. And my own observation on weekends is it's fairly full in the morning, but so far there haven't been any fights over the chargers. It seems fairly orderly and people are able to get their car charged. And the $7 is going to be, uh, are, we're going to levy it on a per hour basis. So if somebody doesn't need a full charge, they're not paying 7 bucks. They're just paying buck and a half an hour or whatever it is. That's correct. We're charging on a per kilowatt basis. So you're only paying for the electricity you're actually using. And there's actually a meter then on the on this charging station? On the station itself, mm -hmm. yes. Thank you very much. Mayor Pro Tim Dixon. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just to follow up to Mr. Moser's question, I'm curious, uh, do we have... Uh, fleet of electric vehicles, number one, and then number two, are they charged here or at the city yard? And just a little bit community information about our own fleet, if you would, we, please. We don't have a fleet of electric vehicles. As Mr. Mosier's pointing out, we did, uh, it's probably been 10 years. It was very early in the technology. In fact, they used that paddle charger, and those were at the old city hall. They're probably still there. Um, but they were uh, on lease with Toyota. Remember, there was a period of time when Toyota was leasing those products out. I think GM was doing it too. We gave them back at the end of the lease. We've since moved more towards natural gas, um, especially with our big vehicles, because um, we, ha we have the, the station right there. We just found it's economically better for the city as well as a similar environmental impact to have exchanging that with natural gas. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, no further discussion. Please vote when the screen comes up. Chris and Shannon, you have to sprint. The, sprint, sprint, sprint. The motion carries unanimously, 6-0. Okay. Move on to current business. Our first uh, item of, cur of current business is item 16, limitations on water-propelled vessels in Newport Harbor. Mr. Mayor, yes, uh, I recused myself uh, previously on this matter, and I will do the same as I have a boat rental business. Okay, thank you. Staff? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Chris Miller and Shannon Levin. We are here to talk about the um, Jetpack Ordinance and really just a brief update. Uh, in February, the Council directed staff to uh, come back um, with an ordinance that would limit water-propelled vessels uh, in Newport Harbor to only one uh, commercial operator in the harbor, and um, there would be no recreational users for water-propelled vessels. So that means people who have them in there, they can, they, they can use them in the ocean, but they wouldn't be able to use them in the harbor. Um, the, the staff has, um, we would implement an RFP process and determine who that single operator might be. And if there's any further questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Okay, do we have any questions of staff at this time? Okay, seeing none, I'll open this up for uh, public comment. Uh, please state your name when you approach the podium. Mayor Selich, members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. Um, the first thing I wanted to point out, it was not clear from the presentation, you have two recommendations that I see in the staff report before you. One is to adopt a resolution with a new city council policy, and the other is to uh, uh, it says adopt, it's actually is to introduce an ordinance and adopt it at the next meeting, uh, as happened with an earlier matter that you had doing with, with dealing with massage parlors. In this case, the resolution presupposes that you are going to adopt the ordinance, and you have not yet, you are just tonight introducing it. You have not published in the newspaper your intention to adopt the ordinance, and I think it would be much more appropriate to defer the uh, adoption of the policy by means of the resolution until the meeting two, two weeks from now or whenever it is when you are actually deciding to adopt the ordinance that it refers to. Uh, that said, in the ordinance which you are introducing tonight, 
since it goes to a second reading and you want to get the language correct tonight, I would point out in the whereas of the ordinance, it mentions the water being sucked to the user. I would suggest it's being pumped rather than sucked. And second, I would point out more substantively in the proposed uh, section of the code, it, which has not been reviewed by the Harbor Commission or anybody else. Uh, this is on page 16-11. Uh, it refers to the conditions in which the vessel is powered or maneuvered above, above the surface of the water. I would suggest perhaps you wanted to say if the vessel or the rider is powered or maneuvered above the water because to, to avoid the possibility of somebody disputing whether a rider connected to a hose is actually a vessel or not. And then as to the uh, resolution that you're looking at, possibly tonight, but I would hope two weeks from now. This is on page 16-9. The policy has three lettered pieces to it, an A, B, and a C. Uh, the A says that the city manager may enter into a contract with one operator. I don't know if it's your intention for that to be a may or a shall. That is, do you want to ensure that there is an operator or do you want to leave it to the discretion of the city manager whether there is or is not? And then B seems, even if he allows an operator, it seems to prohibit anybody from actually using the thing. So in policy B, where it says no recreational user will be allowed to operate on the vehicle, you might want to say it's no recreational user other than the one or somehow something, users who are not related to the, to the contract operator. And finally, at previous hearings, people brought up the possibility of liability to the city if the city is encouraging this operation. So in the policy, you want to make might, might want to make sure that the city manager assures that the city is indemnified against liability. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on this item? Okay. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to council. You had one. i got to move quickly. State your name, please. Hi, I'm uh, George Farah. I'm a resident of uh, West Bay Avenue. I've uh, been in that block roughly about 40 years. Uh, uh, I just want to, I guess, uh, just ask the, the question of, we know last, last meeting it, was, uh, it was, seemed like it was decided that there will be one operator. And we just would like to ask that uh, that operator it wasn't clear what area the operator can use in, in the harbor. And we would just like to ask that that area not be between 17th and 20th streets uh, because we've been having problems for the last several years and we have not been able to get any relief from any authority, whether it, you know, harbor <laughs> patrols, whoever, because uh, they are licensed and permitted to operate in that area. And it's been very, and you know, and we all know that their permit expires next month. Um, it's been extremely stressful for most of the residents in the area. Uh, we, we are like, you know, it's not really an exaggeration to say that whenever they're operating, it's a very invasive uh, noise that's causing a lot of stress and a lot of, um, um, well, short tempers and everything else that, that goes along with it. So we would just like to ask that you just appreciate our, our circumstances um, because it's really no different from having um, like a cement truck mixer or I don't know, some sort of a, uh, some other loud activity parked and permitted by the city to be right outside your home. Uh, the comment was made last, last time that the waterways are for everyone and not just for the residents. And we agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, but we'd like to remind everyone that residents are you know, part of the all. And we'd hate to see the commercial expansion be, be, um, be done at such a high expense to local residents. So a lot of us have deep roots 
in, in, the, in the community and we really would hate to just move uh, and get uprooted just because we're not in a position to relax in our own homes. Uh, we, we sent an email, it was kind of late, we sent it like around noon today for, from a, a bunch of the residents. I don't know if every one of you has had a chance to see it or if it's stuck in, you know, <clears throat> with one of your staff members somewhere. If you haven't had a chance to see it, we have extra copies. But that's pretty much what we're asking for, just so we can have some relief. If you would like to have an operator in the harbor, uh, please have them be a little bit further away from, you know, from, from residents. Uh, it, a couple of things were mentioned that... Can I do 15 seconds or...? Yeah, wrap it up, please. Okay, so anyway, so again, the, the issue is that it's constant, it's fixed, and it doesn't move. So it's not like a party boat or plane or something where you know it's going to be over in a few minutes. It's not. So um, anyway, <coughs> just, just to wrap Thank up, you. Please, please give us some relief on this issue. Hopefully, Mr. Piotr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, maybe some questions to staff. Um, you know, they bring up a good point. What, how is our permit going to regulate the locations of where this can occur? And are we requiring them to rotate uh, to various locations? Are there different scenarios or situations in the harbor that will require them to use different parts? There are multiple locations on the harbor where an operator can conduct their activity. Uh, they can do a loop system, and there are also multiple destination locations throughout the harbor. But it's up to the operator's discretion. It is up to the operator and to staff. We can, we can work out a system that makes it acceptable to. <coughs> so does it require them to make a proposal that you approve, or is it more if you get a complaint, you'll go out and work it out with them? I think it's both. Well, if, through an RFP process, we can work out locations. And then uh, if there are issues, we'll work those out as well. And so our, does the agreement allow us to set those restrictions, or does it set the restrictions actually in the agreement? We don't have an agreement yet. Um, we have a current operator who does rotate. They have some select locations in which they like to operate. But in an RFP process or in an agreement, that's something that we can work out at that point. <clears throat> Uh, what are the insurance requirements? How are they holding us harmless? I'd have to defer. Yeah, so in the, in the insurance, or in the contract, we'll have both insurance requirements and indemnity provisions, and we'll work with the risk manager to determine the appropriate levels for those, but I'm imagining it'd be significant, but we haven't worked that out yet. Okay, and the permit length? Is it Once the RFP goes out, is it going to be annual with a renewable how's it going to work this one prescribes for no less than five years but that's something that we can work out as well so if, if they're not performing according to the permit we can discontinue it at any time like any other permit or contract that we have yes right but he would be able or know that he would have the license to operate as the sole vendor for five years assuming that he does a good job <coughs> thank you mr mayor Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Muldoon. Thank you. When you issue the RFP, I have a similar request. Uh, do we have resources available to do uh, sound testing? Sound testing of the current vendor, just to, or have the various proposers actually do the test? Do, well, do that with if us? the city does it, um, the city can then, I think, designate those areas based on uh, how close it is to the home and where maybe sounds alert the loudest. One of my concerns is um, I like the idea of it rotating in certain locations. But I think that um, if it's you know, a couple hundred or a hundred yards away from a home, it may be a little louder. We um, take a look at that. So I'll just, Good thought. yeah, we'd like to see the uh, RFP contain these provisions that would make it more uh, pleasant for the residents. Okay. Mayor Pro Tim Dixon. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, when we had the was a study session on this a few months ago, um, I, as we all did, listened to the presentations and uh, frankly was inclined to go along with the idea of having one operator limited through its operation and designate the areas. Since that study session, I really have, heard, this is primarily affecting residents in my district, yeah. and I've heard from a great many residents, and uh, I will be uh, not supporting this measure, and I'll explain why. Uh, 
I'm really greatly influenced by the unanimous vote of the Harbor Commission who voted against this recommendation. And I respect the Harbor Commission's due diligence on looking into the impact, the noise level impacts, the marine uses of the harbor, uh, other industrial, the prior speaker spoke about kind of an industrial use uh, allowed on the harbor, which is, Chris, you know better than I, frankly, how many industrial uses we permit on the harbor. And this, in my definition, because it is noise producing, and uh, where it could possibly be moved around, it's still going to have an impact on those residential areas. And um, most of the water areas in our harbor front residential property, I think it will have significant negative impacts on our residents, and we are a residential community. I'm very pro-business, but I do think there are alternatives uh, in terms of location. There is the ocean, that's where the jet skis go and the paragliders go. Uh, out Big Corona is a beautiful beach, and I think that could be uh, an area where the jet uh, operation could operate. I had an opportunity to witness this personally. I was out on the water this past weekend, and I saw it with my own eyes. I heard it with my own ears, and I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> I would not want to be living right there wherever it ends up. So I will be voting against it because I want to support the very strong wishes of the residents in District 1 who would be negatively impacted by this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, anyone else want to uh, speak on this item? Please come forward. Is there any other people that want to speak on this item? Would you come to sit down in front here, please? Good evening. Uh, I'm Randy Nunley. Uh, I also live on West Bay uh, Avenue, and that's where they uh, f frequented uh, our area. And uh, it, it is very noisy. And I'm thank you for checking it out and, and seeing firsthand. Um, it's I, I kind of liken it to uh, one of the offshore racing boats. You wouldn't allow a racing boat to kind of stay and rumble around a confined area over length of time. You'd make them leave. We're stuck with it all day long. So thank you for saying what you did. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, my name is Dean O'Malley. I'm the president of Jetpack America. Uh, I want to thank you again for taking the time to consider this issue. Uh, as many of you know, we've worked through a lot of these discussions and we've tried to weigh in and, and provide our input. Um, we understand we are a non-traditional user of the harbor. We're a new business, we're a new industry, a new concept, um, but we do feel that we can fit in. That's been our goal since day one. Um, we tried to be respectful of our neighbors. We've moved around to multiple locations. We do have several in the harbor where we can operate. Um, one of the big issues has always been safety. Safety is always our number one priority. We have a very high staff to customer ratio. Uh, they're concerned about the, the risk to the other users in the harbor. You can compare that to a paddleboard company where an individual paddleboarder can unsupervised paddle behind a big boat that's backing out. With our operation, yes, it is perceived to be more risky, but the fact that we have a lot of oversight does keep our, our customers and those around very safe. Um, obviously, noise is one of the big issues. We have conducted our own sound studies. Um, I'm not going to say that it's silent, of course, but uh, we do feel that it is a reasonable level for the daytime operations. Um, <clears throat> and similar to places like John Wayne Airport, that, that's a, a noisy s situation, but there has been a viable um, agreement that's been made in terms of the noise abatement, uh, and we want to do the same thing. We want to avoid the residents as, as much as we can to find a spot that will be work working for the residents, our guests, the tourists that come in. Um, with one last thing to say, um, there are those who are not too keen on our operation. We understand that and we respect that, uh, but we do have a lot of fans of, of what we do. We have residents who love it. We have members of our, uh, our club organization who came and spoke at the last meeting. Uh, we are the number one or, uh, activity on TripAdvisor and, and Yelp. That shows that there's a lot of people out there who do enjoy what we do. We bring business in and we hope to be part of the community going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Piotr. Mr. Dean, I have a question for you. Uh, I mean, I, I, since our last study session, I went around and 
uh, from both the harbor side and uh, land side, mm -hmm. um, your use is really hard as far as compatibility. And uh, I guess the question I've got is why why couldn't you go over on the leeward side of the jetty, say out in front of Corona Del Mar Beach, and, and run your operation there? On a nice calm day, it would be viable, but on many days, the, the wind, the waves, and the current make it very difficult and frankly less safe for uh, first time customers to be out there. As an experienced pilot, I could go out there and, and fly all day long and have a great time, but for a, a first time person, that's where the, the risk is. So, but the jetty would make it pretty calm in front of CDM, except when we get south swells. Mm -hmm. And you're not an everyday operation now, right? You're more of a three-day-a-week type of an operation. Uh, is it possible to make it work out in the ocean? We have even for even for beginners, obviously. We, we have looked at it. Obviously, we, we want to try. We've looked at every single operating location in the harbor, outside the harbor, and up and down the coast. There really aren't that many great spots for it. Um, Unfortunately, we're struggling, I'm not gonna say struggling, but we're working very hard to make our business economically viable because of the fact that we have a very high staff ratio. Um, if we did get pushed out, we'd be talking about longer shuttle rides, we'd have additional staff for that. I don't think it's gonna be economically viable to operate there over the long term. Right, so, your, your land operation have to be more down towards the jetty mouth, and you'd probably wanna take a couple customers out at a time rather than one at a time. Potentially. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else wish to speak on this item? Mayor, Council, my name is Judy Cole. Um, I don't want to rehash all the issues again. I think that um, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon uh, reiterated a lot of the things that we've been trying to get across um, all along. Regardless of what the outcome is and what you all decide. The one point that I'd like to make tonight is that I think that it's um, not a great decision to pass an ordinance when the details of the contracts and the requirements and the regulations have not been worked out if in fact the ordinance is gonna be passed. Um, we don't think it's a good idea. Um, we don't think it's good for the harbor, but if it is something that the council decides that they want to do, then we think that they need to take a real good look at the regulations, the insurance, all of those issues first before you pass the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor and council members, just a suggestion. I'm not sure, quite sure where the council's inclined to go on this, but we could make a commitment as a staff to bring the first contract back to you and have you approve it rather than the city manager in a public setting so you can review it more closely, all those kinds of things that have been brought up. Oh, I think that'd be a good idea. Also, it's important to point out that the ordinance is just really enabling legislation that allows us to go ahead. It may be that we don't get a satisfactory proposal and not have anything come back to us. Okay, any other public comments? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back for a motion. We have a motion. Uh, Councilmember Muldoon. Point of clarification. So we can approve the ordinance and still have the RFP come back for review? Is what you're saying, two steps? If you, if, if that's a part of the motion that you would like this to be brought back, um, at least this, this first contract the first time through, um, we, we would certainly follow that motion. I'd make the motion then to uh, approve the ordinance with the caveat that it be brought back the RFP for review uh, to make sure that um, Do you mean the results that like the contract to be brought back versus the RFP? I guess you could look at both of them, but we do the RFP sorry, then yes. bring the contract back to you for approval That was based on the RFP and you get to review Whether or not you felt that the contract appropriately addressed what you wanted addressed. So it's not too late at that point uh, No, no, okay Yes Okay, does your motion include the resolution, adopting the resolution 2015-29? does. Okay, do we have a second? Okay, I'll second the motion then to get it on the floor. And uh, Council Member Piotr. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, I've done a lot of investigation, mainly by users of the harbor, 
since our last study session, and I've become more convinced it's not a compatible use with the other uses in the harbor, so I will not be supporting the motion. Okay. All right, any other comments from council? Okay, uh, please vote when the screen comes up then. With council members Piotr, Petros, and Mayor Pro Tem Dixon voting no, the motion fails. Okay, we'll move on to item number 17. This is council policy A6, revisiting the RFP for tree trimming services. F. This, can, I, can I have a discussion before you jump to this next one? We're, that's fine what was just voted on, obviously. We're, we're a little... We're now left without any regulation at all. And I, if the city attorney is okay, we would want to have some direction to bring something back to you, whether it was, I'm, I'm sorry, Councilmember Duffield, <laughs> whether it was um, to, to bring back a prohibition in the harbor and something offshore or uh, maintain the, well, the, the no regulation at all, I think is probably a bad option. But if you felt like you could give us some other direction, we can bring that back to you. Well, I, what, I just don't what we'll be left do is uh, I'll allow the uh, the uh, three prevailing members to each individually give you their their thoughts on it. Then you can use that as your direction. So, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon. So, what is the current situation now? We have one provider, and they're under a, an annual contract. We've got one current operator. They're under a marine activities permit, um, and they're operating under that. It will expire in mid to late May. And Shannon, if somebody were to come into you tomorrow and ask for this kind of operation, would you have to issue a permit? It, I would review it. We would review it. I don't have to issue, but... Okay. But there's no prohibition against you issuing us to a second provider right now? Nope. Oh, well, all right. Just to express my thoughts on the matter i do not support this use in the harbor so when this contract expires i would not renew it i would that would be my preference and i would what's stronger than suggest that we don't accept any more don't provide give issue any more permits for any other provider that would be my preference so that would be we would bring back an ordinance which would propose a prohibition within the harbor in that case I would go along with that. Okay. Mr. Mayor Petros? Okay, did you want to chime in on that at all? Okay, neither do I. Okay, we can at least get going with something. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, so we'll now move on to um, item number 17, Council Policy A6, revisiting the RFP for tree trimming services. So, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, this is your routine discussion of, of items that you'd like placed on a future agenda, and this item involves the uh, whether or not an open request for proposals uh, for tree trimming, or otherwise known as tree maintenance, should be uh, agendized for vote at the next meeting. Typically, this is not a, uh, an opportunity to discuss this matter. It's just whether or not you'd like to see a, a more detailed staff report and a vote on it at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Well, since I'm the one that asked to put it on the agenda, I'll just speak to the item and say that um, some information came to my attention that uh, led me to believe that we ought to consider revisiting this item, and that's why I requested it be put on for consideration. Um, any comments or questions from Council? Seeing none, I'll open it for public comment. Mayor Selich and members of the Council, my name is Jim Mosher, and I'm trying to... Uh, follow uh, Councilmember Petros's direction to sit closer. <laughs> Very considerate, thank you. <laughs> we have, we're, gonna start, we're gonna start timing we, we have heard We have heard the word RFP, request for proposal, quite a lot tonight. Uh, it's featured on both the front and the back of the staff report. It's also featured on our city website where the public looking at our website sees online services there's a section there, the public is supposed to be able to see the RFPs. And my comment on this, that the staff report says that there is an RFP, that's what you're talking about, 
coming back to review that is currently open through May 14th. I can tell you that that, and it, it tells us here it is not on our city website, it's on some other thing, the city's bidding portal, www.planetbids.com. Uh, I'm curious how the public, with our commitment to transparency, is supposed to understand the RFPs and whether the public is supposed to be able to see them. I tried visiting this website. It appeared you had to be a vendor who logged in or something to see the RFP, and uh, the ones that used to be on the city website are disappearing. So as a member of the public, I'm certainly curious what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Next speaker, please. Mayor Selleck and, and uh, council members, my name is Scott Griffiths. I'm the president of Great Scott Tree Service. As you know, our company is, the, is in a second year of a 10-year um, competitively bid uh, contract to provide tree service uh, for your city. And I want to truly thank you guys for that opportunity. Um, it's been a great experience working uh, with your excellent staff uh, who gave us high marks uh, for, per, for the performance uh, and the, on our annual summary evaluation, um, as well as the residents of Newport Beach who have been sending in great reviews. I actually forwarded a review to you guys today from a, a gentleman who lives at a 324 a St. Andrews who was very elated about the work that we did for him today. Um, during these last 17 months, we have inventoried over 41,000 uh, GPS trees at no cost to the city, we, which is a value of over $124,000. We have also purchased over $950,000 worth of equipment that we've dedicated to your city. Uh, we've we've uh, dedicated a staff of uh, four uh, trimming crews and hired a full-time area manager uh, to uh, for this contract. We've also provided a detailed backup for all pre-approved crew rental charges for the city for the future. Uh, we are proud of the high-quality work that we've provided for your city uh, at a cost of 38% less than um, the, to the taxpayers in, in, in the past. And I'm asking that you please allow our, our company to continue this contract and that you vote to suspend the current RFP uh, for the tree trimming services. <clears throat> Thanks again for the opportunity to provide you guys with high quality work, and I'm happy to ask, answer any questions that you might have. Council Member Piotr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just going to clarify, this is to talk about stopping a current RFP process to put a new contract out, correct? Correct. But we're not talking about it tonight. We're just talking about whether we want to agendize, agendize it, it to for talk a future meeting. No, I understand that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Come forward, please. Hello, Mayor and Council. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm Pat Mahoney, president of West Coast Arborist. We were the tree contractor for 20 years for the city. We're proud of the service that we provided you. The Go back in history a little bit that when the contract came out for bid 18 months ago We had made to the to the previous council a mistake dropped the ball We thought the the bid the figures in the bid had come out incorrectly We protested it made several attempts to say hey, it was wrong our bid had the palm trees at the high volume annual con annual trim and we were like $150,000, $150 a tree, which threw us off. But we didn't get, you know, you guys went ahead and awarded it. A year later, or six months ago, we saw it on the council agenda that it came up and the, the current contractor had overspent the contract by over $450,000 without approval and writing or just, just kept trimming the trees and never stopped. At that time, it was voted on by the council to go back out for bid six to zero to go back out. It then came back the next meeting for reconsideration. And at the reconsideration to reconsider it, it was voted down for reconsideration. The RFP is currently on the street. We think we can give you a, a this time the bid is laid out clear. We, we definitely understand it. A much, uh, a very competitive price and do the service that we had done for you in the past. We think the transparency is open. We didn't think it was fair that you put it out for a million three and the person they end up spending a million nine without approval. So we ask you to allow it to continue. When it does continue, it, it'll be transparent. 
the bids will come out and I think it would be fair for, for the residents and, and all the vendors that are, that are out there. But I thank you for the consideration. Thank you. Any other speakers on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back. Uh, Councilmember Piotr. Hey, Mr. Mayor, I, there's enough controversy going on. I'd like to talk about it. Okay, is that a motion? So moved. Do we have a second? A second. Okay. Oh, is it tonight or we're talking about bringing it back? No, we're bringing it back at a future meeting. Okay, uh, any other discussion? Okay, seeing none, please vote. Screen comes up. With Council Member Muldoon voting no, the motion carries 5-1. Okay, uh, Mr. Kiff, are you gonna be bringing this back uh, quickly since that RFP is out on the street? We'll be at the next meeting. At yes. the next meeting, okay. Yes. So both contractors will be at the next meeting's agenda. Okay, on to item number 18. This is regarding the placement of the In God We Trust text in the council chambers. Uh, staff? So Mr. Mayor and council members, this is a request that council member Muldoon brought forward. Um, I, I did uh, wait a little bit to bring it back. I, I had um, suggested that, our, thankfully our public works staff was on the ball to do a couple of mock-ups of what this might look like. Uh, one of them's back there um, above the the big sliders. Uh, another one is um, above the entry to the door, uh, entry for the foyer coming in into the chambers. And there's a couple of other options you see in your staff report. So staff is just interested in direction. Actually, the one back there looks pretty good and is done, But so maybe you want to go with that, but it's really up to, to you guys and Councilmember Muldoon. Okay. Uh, any comments from Council? Okay. Seeing none, I'll open it up for Public comment? Mayor Selich and members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. I find it curious that based on the agenda notice and what we just heard, the only decision before you tonight seems to be what size you want the letters and where you want the letters to be placed. I would have thought you would have first have to decide if you wanted words in the city council chambers at all? And if so, what words? I don't recall that decision having been made, and I don't see it agendized for a decision tonight. Now you may need to pray for me because I am going to say that I think that these are the wrong words to put in the council chamber. I concede that Congress has declared in God we trust to be the motto of the federal government, but like Mr. Molson, who has written comments I found in the lobby, I have some problem with the we in that motto, for if it means all the American people trust in God, they never consulted with many of us. It also strikes me odd that a council of conservatives who resent the intrusion of state and federal government into local affairs would want to promote Congress's notion of a national motto. Not only is it not the motto of Newport Beach, but my understanding is that political inscriptions and mottos are meant to unite and inspire the people. If you want American words of inspiration, which you might emblazon in these chambers, I might suggest liberty, I might suggest freedom, I might suggest justice, I might suggest equality. I might suggest of the people, by the people, for the people. I believe most people could unite around those words, but by contrast, I don't see that trust in God is the basis of American patriotism. And again, I have trouble with the word we. To paraphrase a distinguished American theologian commenting on a similar effort in another city council and the recent promotion of In God We Trust in local politics, the purpose of this is not to unite, but to rather to divide the believers from the non-believers. It is to say we belong and you do not. 
The forces on the religious right that promote this are very strong. They are very persistent. It takes great political courage to resist that force. And I hope that a majority of you tonight has that courage. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, bring it back to council. Councilmember Muldoon. Thank you. Uh, it struck me, as I said, during the um, study session, or was it before a council meeting, a couple of meetings ago, um, that we didn't have these words. These are the official words of the United States motto. Uh, of course, we have federalism. Uh, so we as local governments or a state-created entity um, do not necessarily have to have the same motto. The city does not have an official uh, motto, which I think is, is a great thing about Newport. But I think that this uh, slogan, In God We Trust, this motto, re represents uh, the vast majority of, of Newport Beach residents, uh, citizens, and Americans at large. I know that in polling that was done, it was overwhelmingly supported, and I, I don't view it as, as controversial. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the separation of church and state, although it's not found in, in any of our nation's founding documents, is a very important concept. Contrary to popular misconception, the formal wall of separation between the two institutions was actually intended to protect the church from the state's abuse of power, not the opposite. Separation of church and state, along with the Establishment Clause, were never intended to create a secular society or erase God from our history. <clears throat> the official motto of the United States, quote, in God we trust, is a historical and relative, relevant representation of our Judeo-Christian values that is still religiously neutral. I hope that we may never live in a nation that denies its citizens the right to acknowledge God's rightful place in government, and that is why I propose this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other comments from council? Okay, is there a motion? Well, I get, before, shall we discuss which, uh, if any, um, council member support? Yeah, that might be a good step. I'll, I'll tee it off. I like the one, preferably in the back, but uh, defer to my colleagues. Yeah, Council Member Cuffey. <coughs> Council Member Piotr. Uh, you have one proposed for underneath the seal, and that would be a raised stainless letter like the rest of it, but only about three and a half inches tall or whatever I, I think I right. saw on the staff report. I, th I think that would be my first choice under the seal and my second choice over the sliders. Uh, I, I want to touch on something Mr. Moser said. Um, I have thought about this and have come to the conclusion that it is acceptable to have these words in this body um, because it is something that I believe is a uniting factor, the notion of a, of a God that guides us. Um, so that question has already been answered in my mind. Um, as for its location, uh, I like the fact that it's in the back because it's facing me sitting here as I work on your behalf, the citizens. So I like seeing it as I adjudicate and govern from this seat. Okay. for Jim Dixon. I too prefer uh, oh, back there in the back. Uh, I do think the letters are large. <laughs> um, you might play with some different sizes. They just seem a little large to me. That'd be Those are six and a half. I think there's a four inch option. Those are six and a half. Yeah, just a little less four. forceful in that sense. Thank you. Um, my opinion doesn't matter because I'm not going to be supporting the motion. I don't think that, that it's appropriate to have it in the city council chamber. And I see it in other city council chambers. And, and I know it's a it's a common practice, and if it was something that we had historically had in our old city council chamber, I wouldn't propose removing it, nor um, in this situation would I propose adding it, so I won't be supporting the motion. So, Councilmember Baldoon, do you want to um, be more specific in your motion then? Yes, I move that we uh, place the words, in God we trust, the back of the chambers, uh, in smaller uh, typeset, same font. Okay, we have a second. And I'll second that. Okay. Seeing no further discussion, uh, please vote when the voting screen comes up.
might have to raise your hand. I'm Jennifer Spencer. Okay. With Mayor Selich voting no, the motion carries 5 1. Okay. On to item number 19. This is the Dover Drive and West Cliff Drive Street Rehabilitation Award of uh, Concrat Contract Number 5583A. Staff? Yes, Mayor, Council Members, Dave Webb, Public Works Director. Excited to bring you another construction project. Hate to say that, but this is a really long awaited project. We've been looking to get on Dover for a long time. If you've been on Dover, the landscaping's pretty much shot. Um, the road's torn up from a prior Orange County Sanitation District project. And um, we've been actually waiting because we want the Sanitation District to get off Coast Highway because that's going to be our bypass around it. So tonight we're looking at Dover Drive, West Cliff Pavement, the, the map. I'm sorry, can I get that up on the screen? map before you shows the location of the uh, project. This is basically a pavement rehabilitation project along with a landscape uh, overdue on Dover Drive. The project includes basically pavement repair and overlay, sidewalks, driveway repairs, ADA ramp inclusion, and we're gonna overlay the whole project with a rubberized pavement, which gives it a nice smooth surface. It also reduces the uh, sound decibels on the uh, roadway. The roadway will also get a on-street bike lane throughout that from PCH all the way up to Irvine Avenue. And then we'll be rehabilitating four signals as we do this, uh, the four major signals along the roadway. And then the other key project part is the beautification landscaping of the medians. Uh, we did bring this to the prior council in April 2014 for a discussion on what they wanted in the medians. We um, were given direction to redo the medians, do more of a native landscape, so you'll see oaks, pine trees, uh, et cetera, out there, water efficient landscaping. Um, all of that's built into the project. The project award tonight is for $3,293,293 to All American Asphalt, and we recommend your approval on that project. Okay, Councilmember Petros. Um, Dave, there already were bike lanes um, on Dover. Uh, as you come up from PCH heading northbound, there's a curve uh, where the width of the lane and the width of the bike lane increase, and the sight distance is slightly compromised there. I, I will support this. I'm hopeful that maybe you and maybe Mr. Summers can take a look at that extra pavement there and do as you've done uh, on San Joaquin Hill, Spyglass, and others, and see if there isn't a way to chevron out a part of that extra pavement to give a little bit more bike safety in that, because a lot of times motorists coming on that inside curve in the number two lane will roll into the bike lane. We'll take a look at that and where that spot, and, and this does bring the bike lanes after um, West Cliff goes all the way up to Irvine, so we're yeah. And then, and then second, especially given now this fourth year of drought, uh, I was very appreciative to see issues like boulders, rocks, and other uh, items to be placed in the medians. Uh, if you could please sharpen your pencil, take another look at that landscape palette and see if there is an even more Xeriscape or California natives that can be put in, very similar to what's at, uh, uh, help me, Castaways now, just bring that over so that we can uh, moderate our, our irrigation there. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Where was, where was that lane issue at? At what spot? Down as, as you're uh, heading north on Dover, coming away from the free right turn lane, you, you sweep past the lower castaways driveway. There's a bus shelter. Mm -hmm. And then right there, it, it, the, the curve starts to uh, get, uh, Tighter. Put the screen up. I'll pass it up. Can you can you point it out? Dave? I've got a picture here. It's just before there's you get an the extra bit of pavement in there, and if we could just get a little bit more protection for the cyclist, I think that that's what I'm trying to get at. Coast Highway down here. If you're looking as you go up Dover towards Cliff, this area right here, right the, there. the street jogs out, and there's a wide area of pavement. There's some drainage structures there, so we'll need to make sure the striping pushes the bikes out. Yeah, co coming around to the toe of the slope too. In that in that curve right there Where's where the toe of the slope is, right in there. Okay. There's some sight distance issues, and, and, and I think you know what I'm trying to get at. We'll have to put a buffer up in there and shove run it out. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Okay. All right, any public comment on this item? Mayor Selichin, members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. 
Uh, like Councilman Petros, I am pleased to see that this rehabilitation is kindly, finally coming to fruition. I'm also pleased to see that the pine trees are not being replaced by palm trees. And my main comment is that the public, again, as is common in public works con uh, proposals or staff reports, does not have the advantage of seeing either the RFP or the contract with its scope of services. So I'm just guessing and trying to infer from the staff report that I do see. We've heard there's a single contract and the low bidder and the one who it's being awarded to is called All American Asphalt. That name does not strike the public as being a real expert in the field of landscaping. So I'm wondering if there is a second contract for landscaping or if All American Asphalt is going to be somehow handling it for us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You want to answer that, Dave? Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. Typically in our asphalt contracts, the primary contractor will be the major sub, but we'll have subs like uh, Valley Crest or some of the landscape sub come and do all the actual landscape work. So that will be done by a landscape subcontractor and the paving will be done by All American. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bring it back to council. Is there a motion? I move uh, the action. Second. Okay. Uh, please vote when the screen comes up. The motion carries unanimously, 6-0. Okay, next is item number 20. This is the HUD Section 108 loan refinancing. Staff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. This item proposes the City uh, consider refinancing an existing uh, loan from the uh, U.S. Department of Housing Urban Development. Um, there would, the savings uh, uh, from this proposal are estimated to have a net present value of over 170,000 uh, with an internal rate of return approaching 58%. So um, there's minimal staff work involved and I, I, can, um, I highly recommend the city uh, exercise this option. Okay. Thank you. Any questions of staff? Seeing none, we'll uh, open for public comment. Any public comment? Okay, seeing none, I'll Bring it back for motion. I would move the uh, action. Second. Okay. Please vote when the screen comes up. The motion carries unanimously, 6-0. Okay, Madam Clerk. Motion for reconsideration. A motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the City Council at either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the Council members who voted for the prevailing side. Okay, any motions for reconsideration? Okay, seeing none, we're adjourned. <coughs> or nine o'clock.